Inside America's Boardrooms, the informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, your show host and the CEO of Boardroom Resources. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today, we're going to talk about what boards can expect, expect from the Trump administration. And joining me as a special guest today, it's Troy Paredes, who's the former SEC commissioner and who's also the head and founder of Paredes Strategies who works with companies on SEC and related issues. Welcome, Troy. Thanks for having me. So it's not like this is the first time we're sitting down. In fact, two days after the election, you and I were speakers at an event where I interviewed you. And it was pretty timely because uh, the audience got the benefit of hearing your views of what you thought would happen. Well, we're two months in now so you have more intelligence and we thought it might be a great idea to have you back and to talk about that so probably a good place to start is in those two months talk a little bit about the tone of um, whether that matches what you thought uh, would be happening and sort of how in the general sense boards should feel relative to what mr trump has done so far well, as you said, the question couldn't be more uh, timely. Uh, we've had some time to reflect on that. We have the inauguration coming up. From my perspective, I'm quite optimistic that we're going to see pro-growth policies. And that could take a lot of forms. I'm sure we'll talk more in terms of what that means on the regulatory front. But if there's any indication, I think, in terms of expectations, we can see what the markets have done over the course of the last number of weeks. And so I think I'm not the only one who's optimistic that we're going to see pro-growth policies. I think the market generally uh, is optimistic. Uh, and that's going to be extraordinarily uh, welcomed, uh, assuming that, in fact, plays, uh, plays out as, as, as I'm expecting that it uh, will. And I'm, and I'm optimistic that it uh, will. We've been in a period now for some time where uh, companies have had to shoulder mounting amounts of regulation. Uh, and for that to be, if you will, right-sized, in a way that's going to spur innovation, spur competition, spur growth, and just ensure that for the long term the U.S. Uh, has the most competitive uh, environment globally, I think, again, is going to be extraordinarily welcome, and I'm optimistic that's what we'll see. You mentioned regulation, and we can't have a discussion like this without talking about Dodd-Frank. Um, there's still things that are looming there, and there's things that are already in place that people say are targeted, but um, I'm not sure anybody knows for sure what's going to happen, but Give us your best uh, estimate of what you think is going to happen relative to uh, either uh, rolling back some of the things or canceling some that are scheduled. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of discussion uh, around Dodd-Frank in particular. Uh, we talk in terms, or folks talk in terms of, you know, dismantling uh, Dodd-Frank as compared to perhaps a wholesale uh, repeal of Dodd-Frank. What that recognizes is, is that there will be a provision-by-provision -provision analysis or at least a title-by-title -title analysis uh, in terms of assessing what changes should be, uh, should be made. I think when it comes to you know, banks, there will continue to be stringent capital liquidity requirements. Chairman Hinsterling has indicated uh, as much, uh, Chairman Hinsterling House Financial Services uh, Committee. But that having been said, there's plenty of room for improvement uh, when it comes to the regulatory environment, Dodd-Frank, uh, and otherwise. When it comes to the boardroom uh, and speaking beyond uh, financial services, a number of the requirements that were put in place in terms of some rulemakings that the SEC was mandated to undertake uh, relating most notably to executive compensation, uh, those have been front and center as topics of discussion uh, for potential you know, repeal or, or other uh, changes to. Uh, that would be a significant, uh, a significant development. Uh, it would get away from an approach uh, where the federal government is dictating uh, in a way that it has in more recent years, governance uh, uh, matters as well as comp uh, matters and, and, and really privilege private ordering and allowing companies to figure out what works best uh, for them. Uh, as you said, though, we'll see exactly how things play themselves out, but that's an area that's received uh, a fair amount of attention as uh, a topic for potential reform and change uh, rooted in Dodd-Frank. Uh, Some other areas 
uh, are the Department of Labor fiduciary uh, rule, which has gotten a lot of attention. Um, there's discussion there about changing uh, that rule, uh, pulling back that rule, uh, amending that rule. There's lots of different possibilities in terms of how that could play itself out, but that's a front and center uh, issue as well. So is the Financial Stability Oversight Council and its authority when it comes to designating certain non-banks as systemically significant and therefore in for uh, a lot more regulation. So that's uh, on the table. So there are a number of significant changes that have been discussed, as you indicated. Time will tell in terms of how it exactly plays out, uh, but those are some that are top of mind. Now let's get into the meat of the topic, the yeah. SEC, okay? Yeah. We um, have heard um, um, just recently, since you and I had last talked, that uh, somebody's been put up uh, right. for the chair. Talk a little bit about what you see happening at the SEC and what this chairman would be like. Yeah. Well, one of the things I know, from, again, from my time at the commission, you don't really know how you're going to uh, do in any particular job until you're there. Here, I'll speak, I'll speak personally. And, and then when you're in the position, you're faced with all the facts and circumstances, the back and forth, and what really is the deliberative process that's, that's the hallmark uh, of the SEC with its five commissioners and, and politically divided uh, and the like. So I want to be uh, a bit circumspect in terms of uh, predicting what the future exactly may hold. But having said that, you know, over the, over the last number of years, when you think about the SEC's mission, as anybody who's a close follower can tell you, the SEC has a, a tripartite mission, investor protection, fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitating capital formation. Um, I think any chair will be focusing on all aspects of that mission, uh, but I might expect that capital formation will get its appropriate due uh, and consideration. Um, not to the exclusion of investor protection and not to the exclusion of fair, orderly, and efficient markets, but recognizing that the Commission has an important role, as identified by its mission, to have a regulatory environment that doesn't unduly stifle capital formation. Because when you, of course, unduly stifle capital formation, that ultimately comes at the expense of jobs, innovation, growth, uh, the, the well-being of, of the economy. So when we think about how to prioritize, again, across all aspects of what the agency has responsibility uh, for, uh, I'm optimistic and hopeful that capital formation and facilitating it uh, will, as I said, receive its appropriate due, uh, along with the other aspects of the Commission's mission. And we see a regulatory environment that really does foster uh, growth. Do, are there any other observations that you might make that over these last two months sort of struck you that would is significantly something the board should sort of keep their eye on? It's a terrific question because with all the change and, and all the uncertainty as indicated that you always get with change, it does raise the question that you pose, which is where does that leave boards? Where does that leave uh, senior management? So I think as we think about the role of the board, not only thinking about what's changing, but thinking about certain things that are likely, frankly, to stay the same for the most part. I think there'll continue to be significant focus on compliance. I think there'll be continue to be significant focus on uh, 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 governance, both in terms of practices and governance structures and the role of the board. There continue to be a lot of focus on cyber and technology uh, more generally. There'll continue to be a lot of focus, as there should be, on the part of boards in terms of reputational risk for the company, which is increasingly uh, front and center. And I think when you play that out against the backdrop of a question we see frequently asked when something goes wrong, which is, where was the board? What that really highlights is the front and center role and responsibility that the board has. And what that is to then say is, is what each individual board member has. And so without talking about anything specific, but just thinking about the board and directors and how they engage, uh, engagement is, in fact, uh, the word of the day in some sense, which is to say the board and the individual board members uh, being actively engaged, um, asking the tough questions, uh, asking the tough questions in a spirit of trying to get to the right uh, answer uh, and having a fulsome conversation when that's what's required. Quite frankly, it's exactly the model of the SEC in some sense with five commissioners right. and people from different backgrounds who are supposed to really have a serious deliberation. I'm a big fan of the deliberative process. I'm a big fan of the idea that sharing ideas and asking the tough questions and being able to deliver the tough news is really the right way and the best way to get uh, to the best answer. And that's something that persists. So even as everything else changes uh, in terms of how the board goes about doing uh, what it does and fulfilling its responsibilities, the other uh, quick point, uh, and I'll end on this in terms of what stayed the same, 
the need to engage with uh, investors, uh, the need to engage and explain what the company has in mind, uh, why it's doing what it's doing, hearing from uh, investors and other stakeholders. It's good, useful input, uh, and it's a way to uh, make sure that the folks who are focused on what the company is doing or what the board's doing uh, have a proper understanding. Uh, there's no substitute, I think, for effective engagement. That's been uh, a focus over the last handful of years, and I think it's continued to be uh, the case going forward. Well, uh, it sounds like you'd make a very good director of a public company. <laughs> thank you. So, um, Troy, I can't thank you enough. I value you. your contribution. Um, I'd like to invite you back sometime so to. we can take a look at this maybe six months or even a year out and Perfect. see how good your predictions actually <laughs> were. Uh, but I want to thank you again for taking time in your busy schedule to join us. I appreciate it. Thanks a ton. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take a look at another critical topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with Knowledge Partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance.